Welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome uh, Adi here. Now, um, Adi has been a student here at the BGPX program. You finished up in 2009. And prior to that, he worked with Accenture. Uh, he was then a BGPX student. Uh, he was in Accenture in the US. Uh, not in the US. He was in post CGP and he joined Accenture. Again, he was back in the US. And then at some stage, he decided to, uh, to get into academia. So he then signed up and he completed an FPM or the PhD at Harvard. Uh, he's now working in Australia. And um, like the previous guest, we keep bumping into each other at the academy. And I said, why don't you come now and do a presentation? So welcome to Ayan Mukhubad. I have not started after you finish your PGPX. No, it, it is a 10 year gap, so it's, it's a great opportunity to come back after a 10 year gap. And welcome again. Thank you. Thank you, Mukesh. And this is for you. Oh, love. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. So again, thank you, Mukesh, for the very uh, kind words. And thank you, everyone, for being here. The presentation I'm making today is joint work with my advisor, Tarun Khanna, at Harvard Business School. Uh, so, uh, and this is currently under review at the journal. So, this is what I am thinking. So, I have a very loud voice and I have to be really careful because it seems the mic is amplifying it significantly. So, this is the agenda I thought uh, we will go through today. Uh, because I am meeting many of you for the first time, I thought it makes sense to talk briefly about my research agenda and then dive into the specific paper we are discussing. So very broadly speaking, I am interested in the management of innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, essentially, I look at contexts within the healthcare industry and use field with research methods to study these innovation entrepreneurship initiatives to make sense of the underlying mechanisms uh, so that how we can manage these initiatives better. Uh, one thing I would also like to highlight here about my work is when I talk about innovation entrepreneurship, I'm trying to look at the entire spectrum. So like process innovation in healthcare, product medical device development within healthcare, and uh, even operating model, business model level innovation. So I try to cover the entire spectrum. I'm not going to get into details of some of those other projects in the interest of time today. Uh, but if you are interested, I am happy to go into the details at a later point. So the people which the research I am going to discuss today is actually coming out of my dissertation. And the fundamental question the research explores is like how does an organization develop appropriate resources for the host country? Uh, two things I need to caveat here. One is, uh, I'm using the word resources in a very broad sense, right? Which covers knowledge processes, and it's pretty standard in the strategy world to have this larger meaning of resources. Um, the second thing is, and I, I can confess it in this audience, uh, even with the video recording going on, often in field research, these questions comes much later, right? So the initial way the project got started was um, Dr. Devi Shetty's like, NH Narayana Health Group was moving into Cayman Islands. Um, this is around 2013. I happened to be there at the hospital doing some other research. And I realized that this is a very interesting entrepreneurial initiative for that organization because they have never been outside India. And their claim to fame, as most of you know, is treating the largely the indigent population in India, low cost uh, care for the masses. And so what was interesting here is the fact that instead of going abroad to countries like Bangladesh or Sub-Saharan Africa, where their model has a lot of relevance, they decided to go to a place like Cayman Islands to serve patients from the US, uh, which makes it interesting, right? Just the difference in context if you think of the two countries. Because we already know from past research uh, in international business and strategy that when companies go abroad, they do need to adapt their uh, business model, operating model 
to match to the local context. And so we usually refer to this as the Replication Adaptation Balancing Act. You want to be able to replicate the things which have made you successful in the past in your home country or other host countries. But at the same time, you do need to adapt to make sure that what you are doing is consistent with the local context. So the idea is very simple here, but repeatedly we have seen companies struggle to do that. Because on one hand, it's very easy to make the argument that you need to manage this replication adaptation. But the next set of questions, what exactly do you replicate? What do you adapt? What should the adaptation look like? How fast should you adapt? There are no good like templates uh, for organizations to follow. So the Replication Adaptation Act becomes often challenging. And we can think of multiple instances where companies have entered new markets, which are very contextually very different. And they have struggled to develop a successful operating model. And here I show just one example. Right? Walmart has been in China for now 20, more than 20 years. And if you look on the net, you will see, see a series of questions they are still grappling with in that market. Now, as good researchers, we also understand why replication adaptation is hard to manage, right? So a, a series of explanations have been offered. I'm not going to go through all the bullet points, but I'm going to highlight the second last one, specifically the idea of causal ambiguity, where we claim uh, in causal ambiguity that organizations often themselves do not know why they are successful, right? So they do something they believe, but they are not able to separate out context, like advantages they have by being embedded in certain context or environment or having access to certain resources or regulatory advantages they enjoy because they're so used to it. It's like oxygen. So when we have oxygen, we never think of oxygen and we function without it, without thinking of it. And so those kind of things come in. And the other thing is, in causal ambiguity, they will claim that you have multiple input variables, but it's very hard to know how they're interacting with each other. And this goes partly into the NK literature, uh, if, if you think of the NK landscape challenges. So, so there is this whole causal ambiguity issue, which then says that if you go into the host country and you start adapting certain things, leaving other things same, like replicating other things, it's hard for you to predict what the final outcome will look like which also leads to this performance issue. The performance issue, uh, I think I should add one more thing here. The performance issue is also uh, very obvious in the initial stages of internationalization. So research has pointed out to the fact that uh, often when companies enter new market, they will see a dip in performance. They will have the initial struggle till local learning, local adaptations take over. And eventually, after a period of time, they start like, moving up in, on the performance curve. So given all this, the, one of the proposed uh, mechanisms which has been advised organizations should follow uh, is this mini idea of mini jumps. Right? So what essentially it says is that do not, go, do not take big jumps into countries where the context is very dissimilar. Of course, the risk is higher. Make smaller jumps to contexts which you are more likely to manage, which are similar to where you have already operated. And by doing a series of similar jumps, you can then cover or traverse the bigger contextual difference which you are thinking about. Now, this logic, as you would expect, is very much counter to the jump NH is making in our case study. Again, going from India, largely indigent population uh, segment to US, to Cayman Islands for the US segment. And that itself makes uh, this particular case a, like a theoretical sampling candidate, right? So by, I mean, I, it's not a representative sample um, in field research. I'm using a theoretical sample. I pick it for specific reasons because it's an outlier, because we hope that it may help us build theory or discover new theory or propose new theory. Related to this is the idea of recombination, right? So when we were talking about these mini jumps, one of the related idea is, uh, and I think Perkins recently also mentioned, referred to it, that when you go through these multiple host countries and you end up on the nth country, you may be able to recombine 
past experiences from different markets, which is what gives you the advantage now to deal with this very unfamiliar territory because you have a whole lot of experiences and learning and resources to fall back on. And it's a great idea, right? The idea of recombination is not entirely new. In fact, the idea of renovation, recombination is almost 100 years old, and it has been shown empirically um, using uh, patent citation, using bibliographic references. So it's a well-established idea. We, we talk a lot about recombination in the product development literature, where you can make a new product by recombining right, parts or components of other products. Now, building on that, yes, the recombination idea should be uh, feasible in internationalization context, but uh, the unfortunate fact is uh, the discussion has not gone much beyond, right? Uh, so no, I mean, there are some r real questions. If recombination has to happen, what are the mechanisms? How can a country manage to do an exhaustive ass assessment of resources which are geographically scattered across countries and then make a decision of which ones to pick and use in the host country under consideration. And also, uh, given that, there will be some level of tension and competition between each of these different countries. Uh, are the, does anyone really have access to all that information, resources? Do they have the understanding to be able to recombine? A lot of those questions have not been fully explored. And uh, I think our research addresses some of that. What we find in the NH case, uh, NH to the journey to the Cayman, is that uh, recombination is not only possible, we show how it happens, we look at the mechanisms, but m the more interesting thing here is uh, we observe that recombination is possible just pulling resources from the home country itself. If the home country has some level of heterogeneity, uh, what that allows, so in a heterogeneous country like India specifically, you can think of different market segments. And uh, if a firm engages in all these different market segments and develop market specific resources, then you end up with this like menu card of resource available to you, and then that should allow you, theoretically, and we will show how it happens, to be able to do some kind of recombination from all those resources you are developing for market segments. Now, a very valid point here would be like, hey, India is multiple countries, we all know that, what's surprising? Um, no, it's not, but uh, let's also acknowledge the fact that India is not the only heterogeneous country. Uh, I mean, even if you look at, I mean, China is of course there, but even if you look at countries like US, there is enough heterogeneity. The problem is, going back to the Walmart example I showed, a lot of organizations believe replication as strategy. They will narrow down on a market segment very quickly based on attractiveness, their capabilities, market growth, and they will start penetrating that more and more using replication. If you think of Apollo Fortis, like as other hospital groups, they have used replication as a strategy. I mean, I'm just using Sulansky's like paper title in SMJ, and they have used replication as a strategy much more effectively rather than trying to cover a broad range of segments. So Walmart, right? Walmart has a typical operating model in the US, outside big cities, large warehouse like layout, and that works, and they have replicated it again and again. So when they come to an entirely new context, it takes a lot long for them first to figure out what they need to do. And there, there's a related question at a cognitive level, can their managers handle and go through this design process easily because they may lack that flexibility. So that's what we see and I mean, we argue that if a firm is adapting to this, all these heterogeneous market segments, you, you start developing how context influences your operation. So the causal ambiguity starts going down. So for example, if you're in Bangalore and you're used to like uh, access to resources, let's say nurses, and then you go to a small town like Kolar and you don't find nurses, you have to rethink your operations differently, right? So you cannot take availability of nurses as, gr like as granted. 
So those are the kind of satellites which allow you to reduce the level of causal ambiguity you experience. You also develop design capabilities, and finally you end up with a much broader set of resources across these segments. And then, theoretically, you should be able to recombine from these segments. So what we argue in this paper is what we are offering is a process model of recombination in the internationalization context. So what we are essentially saying that the idea of replication adaptation has long been recognized. But we are showing one way to adapt is by recombining multiple resources which you might have developed even in your home country. Uh, and I will come back why a single home country heterogeneity is better than multiple host countries. And if you, you might already um, have realized that, it's just the challenge of having access to that diverse set of resources across multiple host countries, having the understanding and going through the integration process becomes a lot more challenging when the set of resources gets geographically dispersed. It's not under your control directly. Uh, specifically, right, so some of the doctoral students requested, like what happened during the RNR. So when we first made the submission, um, we didn't have a well-developed process model. We didn't talk a lot about the mechanisms. Um, so, and so there was pushback on that. So in the next round, we went back. And so we had to like, we came up with like six distinct mechanisms, right? And we showed how each one works. And of course, we have a very nice process model in the paper, which I didn't draw, but these are the six mechanisms, the process model, the whole idea, right? And I'll quickly go through these uh, mechanisms at a more theoretical level now, but then when I go into the case facts, you will see the association. The first is, right, you have to develop diverse resources to address the contextual heterogeneity. Now, this is a choice. So one of the reviewers uh, kept pushing back, saying that, do you mean that all companies in India will be able to do it? We never claim all companies will be able to do it. You are only able to do it conditional to the fact you have engaged with the heterogeneity and have developed a broad set of resources. Just because you happen to be from a high heterogeneity country doesn't guarantee that you will be able to recombine. So this is a choice a firm makes. This is where, sorry, this is where agency and leadership becomes important. You do develop, going back to my point around reducing contextual, uh, uh, sorry, causal ambiguity, the second point is related to that. You, you develop your design capabilities because now you are building operations or business models for varying contexts again and again. So now you, you're not, your mindset, you, you end up having more cognitive flexibility of problem solving. Third thing is very important, right? The retention of knowledge about diverse resources such that you will be able to retrieve those at a later point. This is my point against what I believe recombining from multiple host countries will be a challenge because this thing will go against when resources are spread over m multiple host countries. But within a home country, that information is more e easily available and better understood by senior management. The fourth point is when you think of expanding in the host country, you almost have to do some kind of a problem decomposition and think what are the key things we need to address. Uh, because that what makes sure that the recombination process moves forward. Then the fifth and sixth is essentially making the connection of the sub-problems you have to solve in the host country to the resources you might have developed back home earlier and then integrating them in a way which is effective in the host market. So in the host country. So these, uh, so there's a process model and we had to add a section and then tie our case narrative well with these mechanisms so that the reader can clearly see that these six things are going on. So one of the things we argue right in our paper is look, like, look this is significant uh, contribution because even though the idea of recombination at organizational level has been talked at length, uh, we do not get into questions like how does the agent know what resources are available? How, do, how does the agent have the design ability 
to consider all these diverse resources and make a judgment which what works. So many of the mechanisms related to recombination has not been like explicitly shown or discussed. Even in the empirical work where recombination has been shown using uh, patient citation and bibliographic references, you just show that recombination has happened without having any understanding of what the process was, right, which led for recombination to be effective. Now that said, uh, I will stop here because what I have done, I think so far, is given you the gist of the paper. The, the, latter, the next part will be all about methods and the case facts, which will help you see some of these arguments, where they are coming from. But I'm happy to, like if there's a question or something's not clear, I'm happy to discuss that before I move forward. Yeah, the context is that uh, they were setting up a teaching hospital in the Cayman Islands. Uh, no, it's a, it's a clinical hospital to deliver care to patients. It's not a teaching hospital. It is a, it's a hospital for the primarily the Caribbean market and the US market. See, another feature that was reported in the New York Times a few years ago was this outsourcing of medical education, which is so expensive in the US. And this example was used. Now, would that change? So, you have a very valid point. Now, when I think about it, yes, uh, medical education can definitely be done. Uh, I mean, students can come to India or even markets like Cayman. And by the way, many US patients go to medical schools in the Caribbean exactly for this reason. Uh, my paper does not get into the medical education part. It's outside the scope. Medical education doesn't show up in my study, but I do see there may be some parallels. So, uh, according to your paper, uh, So that, that's a great question, but I think let's come back to that when I go into the case narrative, right? Because that's where this question, I think um, you will be able to see the argument a little more clearly and we can revisit the discussion at, at that point if that's okay. And just to clarify again, uh, so they were catering to the local population in the Cayman Islands, which was their market. Yes, Mukesh, I'll come to that. I, I have not gone into the case specifics, the context specifics at all. I just uh, so far have presented like how recombination can happen during internationalization if the organization concerned has a broad set of resources in the home country because they were engaging with the heterogeneity within the home country. Uh, that's, that's the finding, that's the process model. Uh, that's what we argue our contribution is. I will uh, go through the case details, how we come to this conclusion. Yes. So I, so I know this work on contextual intelligence that Tarun published a couple of years ago. Yeah. Mm, uh, and maybe you already addressed this in the later, but what I am still wondering is, let's take the example of nurses. Yeah. So I have a resource in home country, which I utilize to, to do certain activity. One way is to make sure to have a contextual intelligence to get that resource in that host country. But uh, we also look at something where maybe that is not a resource you require there, or you require it in a different way. So I'm talking about the contextual nature of resource. Yes. So I will, I, will, I will answer that now and I will come back. So the short answer is, let's take the nurses example because I gave the example so that naturally has triggered this set of questions. Uh, Nurses in a big city hospital, which has enough volume, they can be uh, staffed in a way where they're specialized. So they will have outpatient nurses, uh, they will have uh, ward nurses, and they will have ICU nurses. And they do not cross over, right? Because the volumes are so high, 
in India at these big hospitals that you can do permanent like dedicated staffing. When you go to small towns, the volume fluctuates a lot more. And so what they have done with nurses there, the same set of nurses goes to ICU, goes to ward, goes to right. So again, so yeah, the nurses are nurses, but the way you staff them, the way you train them, so they have affluent hospitals for the affluent, where uh, the nurses have to be able to communicate far more effectively. So if I observe the nurses at which who are mainly dealing with this large hospital, the, largely the um, indigent population, the patients don't ask questions. And even if the patients don't ask questions, the nurses never talk. They are very, very like task focused. The doctors do all the talking. They're not supposed to talk and they can get away. But if you are in Whitefield in one of their fancier hospitals and the patient asks the nurse that when should I take the medicine or what is this medicine for? And if the nurse cannot reply back, so again, the communication, staffing, all those things have to be considered for the same function nurse, depending on what segment you are catering to. And when I say the word resources, nurse is not only the resource, using the broader definition of resources, uh, we are arguing that how you deploy these nurses, how do you train these nurses, all come under this idea of resources and these kind of information becomes more valuable like on how what you should do when you go right so if you only dealt with one segment you would only know one way right you don't have the choices available um, you are more restricted in terms of the solutions you can consider but having done many things you can easily look at the different options possible and it's more likely that one of them will be suitable for the host country you are in the, that's that, and I'll build on that. Have you also covered uh, the discovery process of finding the right balance? For example, X and Y, uh, they may think of all these uh, the right balance, or maybe this may be an emergent process which will be after entering the news. So, so Sunil, uh, excellent question. Uh, we have discussed that in the paper, and the reviewers pushed us more because you are right. What you are suggesting is. Even if one attempts such a recombination, it's almost impossible to get a perfect model in the first shot. And you may have to do some local tweaking, which goes beyond your home country experiences. All that is there in the paper. I'm not sure how much I can cover. I will try to touch upon some of it in the last half an hour. But uh, also for everyone like who wants to look at the entire paper, I'm happy to share with you right, the document over email. Uh, there are many nuances in the paper which I won't be able to get into uh, given of the time constraints. But that's an excellent question and that's something we had to like show. And even, I'm making an assumption that uh, serving heterogeneous markets is easy. It is not. We all know, right, that companies prefer. It's operationally, strategically, cognitively much easier to stick to a narrower segment than treating poor people, rich people, and having all these multiple things going on under the same umbrella. So again, we talk about some of that in the paper, which I may not be able to go into detail right now. So let's jump into the context. And uh, I'm happy to take questions as we go along. Uh, so uh, just feel free to stop me. So we talked about it. And they were opening the hospital in 2014. This is their hospital in Bangalore. I mean, this is one of the main hospitals, the heart surgery hospital where Dr. Shetty sits. This hospital has the reputation of doing 8,000 cardiac surgeries a year, which is, I believe, the largest number globally. Uh, this is the hospital in Cayman Islands. And the question was like, how should NH think about developing resources? They're hugely successful in India. We have been reading cases about them for many years now, but it, Cayman is a different location, different institutional context, uh, US population, insurance providers, right? It's a payout of pocket la market largely in India. So how should they think about it? Because they can't replicate what made them successful. It's a big jump like we talked about. And so that's why we decided to study this. And this is part of my dissertation work, right? So the, it was a long data collection process itself, couple of years because we tracked it in real time. So whatever was in related to Cayman, we were tracking it real time. Whatever was historical as part of NH development from 2001 to 2010, 11, 
that we were getting through interviews and archival documents and various reports, internal and external. Uh, I spent about three months across their different facilities, uh, both in India and Cayman. Fortunately, this project allowed me to visit Cayman Islands a couple of times, which I have no complaints about. Uh, so it was a pretty extensive data collection. And we used a single longitudinal case study design, right? Because it just allows you to see some of the mechanisms I'm arguing better, how it has unraveled over time. So the hospital initially was founded in 2001. So when Dr. Shetty started the hospital, I mean, the whole idea was that his only and primary intent was to provide health care for the indigent masses who did not have access to cardiac care, especially like cardiac surgical care at that time. And so this hospital has done extremely well. I mean, for a Western audience, I have to speak for five, six minutes uh, about what the hospital is and how they use volume to improve learning and to reduce cost, and it's a fact. I'm not going to go through all of that, but the point is we know that this hospital has been extremely popular, right? Other than the case study which we read, I mean, they show up uh, when VG writes uh, in HBR, when Health Affairs talks about reducing healthcare costs in the US. Uh, if you just Google, you will see all popular media outlets has a Dr. Shetty interview like every year or every second year. And that's where the focus is. Now, interestingly, and by the way, we refer to this model, the one which is famous as the factory model. What gets totally ignored are the multiple other models which NH has been doing, which ha just hasn't got that much attention because I mean, it may not be just that cool. Uh, so one of those models is small town, right? So in cities or towns like Kolar, Davinger, Palanpur, and few others, they have set up tertiary care hospitals where they're doing cardiac surgeries very successfully. I mean, this was unprecedented because some of these smaller towns never had access to good quality tertiary care. In parallel, they have set up uh, like nicer hospitals in Whitefield and I forgot the other location where you get a much more affluent segment, right? The software crowd, the corporate crowd. Uh, it looks just like an Apollo 40s, air conditioned, nice staff who will greet you, treat you, less crowded, less waiting time. Doctors give you a lot more time when you talk to them. So these two models, and by the way, I'm limiting it to two models here for the ease of discussion, but they have, there are other models they have also done. I mean, I can make the argument I'm trying to make using these two models, so um, I'm, I'm taking the liberty of not discussing the other models they have um, right now in this presentation. So the key thing here is these models, right, I mean, I've gone and spent time at each of these hospitals. These models have forced NH to think of the like unique resources for each of these models. I'll highlight a couple from this uh, slide. We will come back to this idea in a later slide when we talk about what is getting recombined and why. So uh, let's start with high end, right? If you see the hospital design, the look and feel, as you would expect, entirely different. The soft skill training, right? So a lot of the staff they hire are from the hospitality industry, from hotels, airlines, etc. Uh, the patient experience is key, right? You have to give patients a certain level of uh, comfort there. The bed sheets have to be clean, not just that, how you greet, what kind of newspapers they should have, is it Wi-Fi enabled, and the list goes on and on. Like menu option, what they will have, like they have, you can get customized meal offerings, uh, patient schedule, what's more inter most interesting is I have track surgeons who went from this hospital in, within Bangalore to Whitefield. Here he was giving like three to four minutes per patient. Here it became half an hour. So I asked him, like, why are you spending so much more time? And I know the answer, but I still ask him. As a researcher, you have to ask and see. You can't. And he's like, you know, with affluent patients, they love to talk. I have looked at the report, and I know exactly what I need to do. But if I tell him I know what to do, there is no need to talk, this guy will be seriously upset. So I have to humor him for 
like who is in your house, where are your kids, oh, they're in the US, will they come for surgery? And they have to have a discussion, get your whole history. And then they feel comfortable that I know what I am doing and I have given them the attention. If I don't do that, you can't, right? So this is where, um, again, when I say resources, that's why I was highlighting that resources in a much broader sense than you would think. If NH, now I will throw this point and let's revisit this. If NH was only doing factory model or only doing high-end patients, they would not have these sensitivities on how you change your operating model design. Uh, let's look at small town. Small town, again, is a very interesting case where they spend a lot of time on how they do construction, the layout, uh, prefabricated like building uh, blocks. And they do that, why? Because they figured out that this is also a very price sensitive market, but at the same time, you cannot fall back on the economies of scale like you can in a factory model to push costs down. So you will have limited volume, but you still have to run these hospitals at very low cost, and you cannot use scale. So then you have to do other things to reduce capex and all that to keep overall right your costs contained. So they spend a lot of time there. Things like material management, right? Think about it. In Kolar, if your X-ray machine breaks down, a technician often has more response time. Um, or even regular supplies, the kind of inventory or stock you'd like to maintain in your supplies room. Oh, very interesting physician staffing. So they will always go for physicians in these small town hospitals who can cover a broad range of uh, cases. So if I'm a cardiac surgeon, in the factory model, which is very high volume, I can specialize. I can say, okay, between pediatric and adult, I only do adult cases. And even for adult cases between valves and bypass, I only do adult valve cases. And still there is enough volume for me to keep doing that and be busy every day of the week. Small town, you just don't have that, right? So they will intentionally put in doctors who can do both pediatric surgeries and adult surgeries and a lot of cases. So the choice of surgeon becomes very subtle here, right? Who you want to place. The nurse staffing we talk, right? They will not say you're an ICU nurse, you're an outpatient nurse, you're a ward nurse. A lot of flexibility. Similarly, factory model, a like lot of their uh, clinical protocols, their clinical expertise essentially comes from factory models because they deal huge volume of cases. These are often, again, from less privileged community. So they show up at the very end when the disease is like much worse. And so a lot of their clinical ability, their accreditations, like from US bodies, uh, JCI is joint, Commission International. So all that, like how you get accredited, all that developed here. They didn't worry about accreditation when they were doing small town hospitals because no one cares in that market. So resources got developed and I just wanted to show you. And as you would go, right, there is, of course, a strong, like, learning and entrepreneurial orientation, which is there for this to happen, right? If, if NH was like a public hospital with a lot of MBAs doing a lot of running a lot of Excel sheets, I'm very sure they would have advised Dr. Shetty, don't go there, don't go there, stay in this, this is our target segment. But Dr. Shetty, as an entrepreneur, as a physician entrepreneur, who wanted to make a difference. He, his basic point is that, look, different people need healthcare in different contexts, and we will do our best to address those different needs. And so he never thought about optimizing which model they need to like push. So you see they were very open. Right? And uh, I mean, I will just highlight this first quote. Right? He, he makes the statement, if someone wants to develop a cookie culture model and roll it like McDonald's, healthcare is not going to happen in India. And so there was very clear recognition of that fact, because of which, as a group, they were very open to get into these different segments and then design right, customer solutions for these segments. And like we discussed before, right, engaging with heterogeneity in this manner not only allowed them to recognize some of these contextual issues, which vary from segment to segment, but they're not, they're getting design experience and they're ending up with a broader set of resources compared to if they had just stuck to one model. So now let's, uh, oh, and also this is, these are like small pieces. I'm just 
adding in, which to explain the agency part, uh, a very flat organization till 2011. So you have the hospital facility directors sitting here, right? They're, they're running each hospital. The hospital facility directors reports to CEO, Dr. Raghuvanshi, who reports to Dr. Shetty. The functional head sits in headquarters along with the CEO and chairman, uh, and the hospital functional level managers have dual reporting. Every month, I mean, I have attended some of these review meetings. All the hospitals get discussed in extreme detail, and being practicing, practicing physicians themselves, like Dr. Shetty still operates today, right? I mean, he's CEO or chairman of this very large group with 30 hospitals, but he will do surgery at least two or three days a week in Bangalore still. So the kind of discussion which happens between a hospital facility director and Dr. Shetty is far beyond the financial statements. It's about outcome, what complication developed, why the infection rate is going up or down. And because of this, the reason I highlight this is this goes back to the access and understanding of these diverse set of resources and being able to use it later on. Now, compared to this to a situation where a multinational has multi-country presence and the information is at the country manager level, it's incredibly hard to have uh, visibility to what goes on at a process level, resource level, like. Uh, so that's a challenge, again, making this argument. So even though IB has continuously said that recombination should happen across multiple countries when you go to a new host country, the more I think about it, I think from a practical level, it's extremely hard to do, whereas the case we managed to study closely shows the antecedents and some of the conditions which will lead to recombination being more likely to be successful. Uh, there was org structure strange up to 2011. As the number of hospitals went up, they had to add zonal directors for span of control and reporting. So anyway, let's come to Cayman Islands. I have 15 minutes left. Uh, so Cayman Islands, as you know, island like about 45 minutes by flight from Miami. Uh, very small island, 50,000 people. Normally, no one would think of opening a hospital. Uh, Dr. Shetty knew that getting into U.S. with all their regulations, right, and opening a an hospital isn't feasible. He had always maintained that, I wish I could have a hosp ship hospital, right, on international waters close to U.S., which is outside the U.S. regulatory system and treat patients from there. Uh, came in almost as the ship which he dreamt of. Uh, and Dr. Shetty was always keen to take his model to the US. His belief was that the power of his model, the world needs to see, and by putting it in front of US, he will get the maximum visibility globally. Now, why was Cayman interested? So what happened after the recession in 2008-9, Cayman realized that their economy is dependent on financial services and tourism. And both financial services and tourism got hit badly 2008-9. And that's when they realized they need a third pillar, a third leg of, for their economy, which they thought of as medical tourism, given all the medical challenges, cost discussions in the US. And they said, we are closed. We are already popular as a tourist destination. We can set ourselves as a medical tourism hub. Interestingly, none of the US hospital providers were keen to partner with Cayman, right? Because they had no incentive. Today, Cayman did not have. I mean, Cayman did not have tertiary care. So when patients, when Caymanians needed tertiary care, they had to fly to Florida and pay extremely high right, the cost for health care to get that. So what is the incentive for a US hospital to say, we will do low cost uh, health care in Cayman? So naturally, NH emerges as one of the logical choices. Representatives of Cayman visit um, NH Bangalore, look around, see their hospitals, they become fairly convinced that this is a group, right, which has the ability to help us because they are low cost, quality outcome, uh, they do different things. So uh, they get selected, and uh, in 2010, they sign an agreement, right, and they call the hospital Health City Cayman Islands. That's essentially the name of the project. Uh, the agreement was that in 2014, they were going to start this small 100-bed hospital and then ramp it over uh, up over time to 2,000 beds. 
and the intent was to serve the US along with the Caribbean region and Latin America. So set it up as a medical tourism hub. Because if you look at the population just within Cayman Island, the project, you can't justify the project on that basis. So this is where uh, I was talking about breaking down your international business problem into sub-problems. And that's where uh, NH was very clear, they need to achieve at least four things for this project to be successful. And those four are quite obvious if you look at them. One is you have to have high clinical quality, right? You can't, you can't make medical mistakes. You have to give a certain level of service because you are talking of international patients, right? Americans used to a certain like standard of service. The third thing was they needed to be accredited because accreditation matters a lot when it comes to insurance companies, when it, uh, uh, like even for all the non-market strategy, like even convincing the Cayman government they are running a uh, good shop. Uh, accreditation was important for insurance companies, US insurance companies to send patients to Cayman, all of that. And um, the last thing was they needed to be cost effective. Like without being cost effective, if they have the same cost structure as US hospital, then again it defeats the purpose of being there. So they clearly saw there are four different questions they need to address. And they realized that they have addressed this, right, at different ways in some of the models. So for example, as I talked, right, the clinical expertise was there in the factory model where they're doing 8,000 surgeries a year, no other hospitals doing. Uh, cost, a patient experience, it is definitely the high-end hospitals we talked about. But I also point factory model, because one thing I missed out saying earlier, these factory models also get a lot of international patients, right? And yes, an international patient from Bangladesh may be different than an international patient from US, but think about that. Certain services, like support for visa, airport pickup drop-off, where your family members will stay, right? Will they have access to a local cell phone? Those questions don't change irrespective of where uh, the international patient is coming from. And NH had already developed those for their international patients in the uh, factory model. Uh, they had done uh, a lot of things for being cost effective, both using scale and other mechanisms in their smaller hospitals, like layout, construction. And they did get accreditation in uh, their factory model in Bangalore. The accreditation is an interesting story. I will just say, why did they get accredited? It's again a strange reason. Uh, in 2008, Wall Street Journal had carried a front page article on NH saying, uh, calling Dr. Shetty as the Henry Ford of cardiac surgery. And there was a lot of criticism in the US. I mean, the standard thing US physicians said was, oh, they're doing it the cheap Indian way, right? You can't trust those numbers. And so, of course, Dr. Shetty was not obviously very pleased. And he said that, okay, let JCI come in, like audit our facilities, look at our data, and see whether, right, we are good enough. And that's how they got into JCI accreditation back around in 2009-10. So that same accreditation became valuable. Now they were going into Cayman. And um, so this is where, once they had these sub-problems defined, they could go back and think of resources they had done in their various models to serve these needs. And I, mean, I would almost argue that they do some kind of an analogous reasoning, right? They say, oh, this is the problem. We have to help international patients. Oh, but we do help international patients. And these are the things they need. And oh, by the way, we have standard operating procedures. Let's take them and change them up a little bit, but we can use that. Oh, we need a cost-effective layout. OK, we have a layout. We have made these layouts in Mysore. Why don't we use the Mysore model? And if you see, these are like quotes from some of the interviews. You see that uh, analogous reasoning, uh, analogous rational argument going on at different levels, right? Again, expertise, right? Clinical expertise. They had manuals written up, so they borrowed those manuals. Uh, at the high-end facility, they asked the architects and designers to go and look at their high-end hospitals in Bangalore, how they have done it. And of course, they did adaptation on those, but they had starting point. They already had an idea. Uh, OK, staffing, if you see, uh, OK, that's the surgeon, surgeon argument, right? 
And I know like the surgeon they have put in came in Dr. Binoy. Like he is just amazing. I mean Dr. Binoy used to work with Dr. Shetty for, I mean was his like right hand man, was his like assistant surgeon with Dr. Shetty for the last 8-10 years. So he does a broad range of uh, surgeries. And Binoy was sent over to Cayman knowing that Binoy can do that incredible broad set of cases which may show up because you cannot afford to have 10 different surgeons sitting and waiting for patients in a new project like that because that structurally changes your costs. Uh, again, like nurse staffing. Nurses go across ward and ICU. Uh, this allows us to staff leanly. We, so you see all that and um, I will leave uh, this. I'm not going to read through this, but you, and this is Dr. Raghuvan Shi, their CEO speaking. Um, and you will see, with, even at a very abstract level, how uh, he's touching. I mean, the recombination word, of course, is something we as researchers have put into the phenomenon we observed. I mean, they never said that we are recombining, as you'd expect. But you see that recombination uh, mentality uh, or like there in many of what things they are saying. And so this is, uh, I think, an important table, right? So I looked at the whole hospital design and I said, okay, what's coming from high end? What's coming from the factory model? What's coming from uh, their small town? And again, this is, this is, I would say, not comprehensive. But this takes you 80% of the way when you're thinking of hospital because it covers material supplies, building, clinical expertise, staffing, the processes, accreditation, marketing. So the argument I would make, right, going back to this uh, developing different segments for a heterogeneous market helps is this. Right? Think about it, like just do a thought experiment. If NH had only done one of these models in India and they had continued replicating it and had been very successful. And then they went to Cayman and they had to deal with those four questions. They will have to figure out uh, solutions for a lot of other things in real time. And of course, given enough resources, enough time, enough money, they would have figured it out which is what we observe in standard IB literature, that initially there's a dip in performance, but then corrections take place and performance takes off. They could avoid that. That's what we would like to argue, because they could readily like, pull solutions which were more appropriate and stitch them together. And these are the same six mechanisms I'm not going to read through, but um, hopefully now these mechanisms, like given the case narrative, now you can see right, why we are arguing that these are critical mechanisms for recombination to happen at an organizational level, which have previously been unexplored or underexplored. Oh, and it's the last part. Uh, so this is the hospital they developed. Let's look at the performance. Now I know everyone in this room will argue that, and I will agree to that argument, that it's very difficult to uh, make a causal claim using a single case study. Uh, but for a minute, let's go and look at the performance. They were one of the lowest cost providers, very high quality outcomes. They did two LVADs, which are extremely complex surgeries where you put in an artificial machine to work as the human heart. Uh, it never happened in the entire Caribbean region. About 10 hospitals in the US will do LVAD surgeries. So that got them a lot of attention that how can a hospital within six months of opening start doing LVAD because they were doing LVAD in India. Uh, the patient feedback in terms of experience has been very good. They got JCI accreditation in one year, which again is unusually fast to get an accreditation, a hospital opening and getting accredited within a year, uh, and so on and so forth. So, a good question is, like, was it a complete success? The honest answer is no. What happened is the volumes they had estimated for patients, uh, the volumes did not show up. The volumes were lower. Um, and there are, I will give you the reason, and I'll give you what it means for the recombination argument. The reason is US patients are a lot more picky. US insurance companies started asking, we need large volume patient data before we send 
Right? It became a chicken and egg argument. Insurance companies want to see the hospital is very good with large volume of patient, and NH is saying, where will we get large volume of patient on with an island of 50,000 people? And that just made right getting every insurance company, every country, like, like the process much more complex. That explains why it happened. But if you look at the recombination argument, the way we think about it is in India, getting patients is relatively easy, especially after you have a brand name. There is so much demand in the market that once you are known as an ethical, reasonable quality player, I mean, you don't have to do much marketing. Patients will show up, which we believe that they underestimated, right? So not that recombination will always have positive effects. Here, the challenge was their mindset was patient acquisition is not that challenging. That's what they have been used to for the last 10 years. And this went against them. That's, that's what we believe went on here. So anyway, that's the core argument of the paper. I think we have two minutes or three minutes by that watch. Uh, happy to take questions. Happy to hang around and talk more. And uh, again, if any one of you want to like look at the 40-page paper, uh, just drop me an email. Thank you. So uh, they have, I mean, if you go to their website, right, they have continued doing novel procedures. They have continued to sign up and get new countries on board. My belief is, and I don't track it that actively anymore, uh, my belief is uh, the volumes are still behind what they would like. Now, one thing also, like in interest of time I had left out uh, is, we specifically looked at the first year performance. Because our argument was if you look multi-year performance, then we have no way to uh, untangle the effect of recombination versus the effect of local learning and real-time adaptation, right? But by looking at the early stage performance, we can say, okay, this is mostly the outcome of what their design has been. Let's see how they are doing. Now, if I look at their performance, so many corrections have happened after three, four years. I won't be able to make any argument that this is what we are seeing post the recombination, right, which we see. Thank you.